Welcome to uh, the first panel this morning, Textualism and the Bill of Rights. It's my privilege to uh, moderate this panel. My name is Tom Hardiman. I'm a judge serving on the Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit with Chambers in Pittsburgh. Confident in the belief uh, that you are here to listen to what our distinguished panelists have to say and not have me tell you ad nauseum about all of their amazing accomplishments, I will dispense with that and only identify them in the briefest form by telling you that we're pleased to have Professor Nicholas Quinn Rosencrantz from Georgetown University Law Center, Professor Eugene Volk from UCLA Law School, Professor Nadine Strassen from New York Law School, and also a past president of the ACLU, uh, Professor Stephanos Bebas from the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and Professor Richard Epstein of NYU Law School. We will proceed in three phases this morning. Each of our panelists will uh, provide an opening statement of 10 minutes, uh, so that'll be the first 50 minutes. After that, we will have approximately 30 minutes of discussion and debate among our panelists, and the last 15 minutes, we will open it up uh, to the floor for questions. So without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor Rosencrantz. Good morning. I'm uh, delighted to be here, and we're talking about uh, textualism and the Bill of Rights. As I understand it, uh, several of my co-panelists are going to talk about certain specific provisions of the Bill of Rights. I'm going to try to talk more uh, generally about text and the Bill of Rights. And the first thing I really want to convey is that text matters, uh, and that textual analysis of the Bill of Rights actually has not been exhausted. I think people have this instinct that, uh, you know, we've been staring at this same bunch of words for 220 odd years, or, and um, that uh, maybe we've seen everything there is to see in the text, and uh, I don't think that's right. I think if you interrogate the text with a fresh, new, different set of questions, you can get an interesting, rich, important set of answers. And so I'm gonna be drawing on a couple of articles I've uh, written in the Stanford Law Review. One is subjects of the Constitution, the other is objects of the Constitution, in which I take a look at the Bill of Rights, but I interrogate it asking a different set of questions, and I get an interesting set of answers. So uh, the set of questions that I approach the Bill of Rights with is what I call the who question. I consider this to be the great overlooked question in constitutional law. Which clauses bind which actors? Which clauses apply to whom? Uh, this is something that we don't talk about much in Con Law 2, the study of rights. Con Law 1, the entire course, is about who questions. Who, separation of powers and federalism, these are at bottom who is empowered to do what? Who is restricted from doing what? When we get to Con Law 2, we are so transfixed by the scope of these, these majestic uh, rights that we don't ask ourselves these basic who questions, who is bound by which clause. So OK, I begin at the beginning with the first word of the First Amendment. It couldn't be clearer. So the First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law. Now, the framers would have been uh, unsurprised to learn that abstract nouns like speech and religion have generated a lot of controversy and litigation. But I think they would have been surprised, actually, to learn that there's any confusion about that first word, Congress. So I want to say that's about as unambiguous of a word as you're going to find in the Bill of Rights. In fact, it's one of the very few terms in the Bill of Rights that's actually a defined term. You can go and look at 1 U.S.C. 1. It's defined prominently, quite what Congress is and what it means. So I don't think it gets any clearer than that. I claim uh, the Bill of Rights says Congress shall make no law. So I make the radical and controversial claim that the First Amendment is about uh, Congress, is about Congress. That's not the conventional wisdom, I'm sad to tell you. The conventional wisdom is um, uh, 
that it applies to all sorts of uh, government actors and not just Congress. Um, now, what I want to say is there may be some equivalent or similar restrictions on presidential behavior, like the uh, take care clause, perhaps the due process clause. It might be some similar restrictions on the judicial power, but those restrictions are not in the First Amendment as written. First Amendment as written is a restriction on Congress. So that's my first radical claim, that we actually have to take the first word of the First Amendment seriously. And, you know, if you don't, I think you've really abandoned the project of textual analysis before you've even gotten out of the gate. So, uh, and then I'm going to suggest that as radical as that sounds, um, taking the first word of the First Amendment seriously actually answers a bunch of uh, tricky doctrinal riddles, things that have uh, been otherwise mysterious. So if you're serious about the first word of the First Amendment, you know, I suppose it would follow if Congress is the only one who can, who can um, violate the Bill of Rights, then I suppose Congress violates the Bill of Rights on the day when it makes a law that abridges the freedom of speech or uh, religion or what have you. And uh, if that's so, I guess that suggests that a challenge on First Amendment grounds has to be a facial challenge uh, as a matter of logic. If something went wrong on the day when Congress made the law, there haven't been any facts yet. The thing hasn't been applied yet. That was the day when, Cong when uh, the Constitution was violated before it was applied to anybody. Now, if that sounds surprising to you, consider that we actually do um, tolerate overbreadth challenges in the First Amendment context in a way that we don't in other contexts. So we actually have this doctrinal anomaly uh, overbreadth, and we have this textual anomaly that the First Amendment says Congress shall make no law and the other uh, amendments don't. So I want to say maybe this textual, maybe this doctrinal um, anomaly can be explained by this textual anomaly. Consider also that we tolerate taxpayer standing in the Establishment Clause context and not in any other context. Why? Perhaps this textual anomaly matches up with this doctrinal anomaly. <coughs> Third, consider that uh, in a case called Employment Division v. Smith, the court said that if a statute is religion neutral on its face, then it doesn't matter if it's being applied to someone who is in the midst of practicing their uh, religion. It's a hugely controversial decision in Employment Division v. Smith, but makes a certain sense if you focus on the first word of the First Amendment, that it's actually the legislature, if anyone, who can violate the First Amendment. So if the legislature is the right actor, then you have to look at the text of the statute. If the text of the statute doesn't say anything about religion, then it probably doesn't violate the religion clauses. So this sort of textual analysis of the first word of the First Amendment proves to be really kind of rich and important and answer some doctrinal riddles when um, uh, it, it's actually commonly overlooked. Uh, people don't actually um, take, haven't actually taken note of it in the past. Now, I'm just going to offer by contrast most of the Bill of Rights. It's actually not written that way. It doesn't say Congress shall make no law. In fact, it's written in the passive voice, making the question much harder. Quite who is bound by these clauses? Much harder to tell. Consider, for example, the Fourth Amendment forbidding unreasonable searches and seizures, but it doesn't specify by whom. Unreasonable searches and seizures by whom. Your instinct could be, aha, well, I guess it must mean everybody, uh, but that can't quite be right. You don't violate the Fourth Amendment when you search your child's bedroom, right? It doesn't apply to private actors. We all know uh, that. But a um, trickier question is, does it apply to states? For that question, you can have a look at perhaps the greatest or one of the greatest textual Supreme Court opinions of all time, Barron v. Baltimore. Uh, Chief Justice Marshall trying to get at, um, the, uh, get at who is bound by these passive voice clauses. And what he does is he looks at Article I, Section 9 and Article I, Section 10. He says it doesn't specify, but maybe I can dig this out of the text by looking at a different uh, clause. Consider that Article 1, Section 9 says uh, no ex post facto law shall be passed. Passive voice, begging the question, passed by whom? But, though, Article 1, Section 10 says 
no state shall pass any ex post facto law. And so Chief Justice Marshall said, aha, I can tell then that the passive voice clause can't possibly bind state officials because if it did, then the active voice no state shall clause would be uh, superfluous, redundant. Um, then he makes this crucial analytical move. He says, uh, I conclude that um, the passive voice clause there in Article 1, Section 9 must bind only the federal government, not the states. And I assume grammatical consistency throughout the document. So if the passive voice clause only binds the feds in Article 1, Section 9, I deduce that that's true throughout the Bill of Rights. So the Bill of Rights also binds only the feds, not the states, despite the fact that it's written in the passive voice. Now what I try to do is bring that same sort of, that same sort of analysis to bear on a slightly different question, which is, okay, these, these only bind the federal government, but which branch of the federal government? They bind the Congress? Do they bind the um, executive? Do they <coughs> bind the judiciary? Uh, sparing you some of the technical analysis, my conclusion in the Fourth Amendment context is that the Fourth Amendment is at least paradigmatically about the executive branch. That shouldn't be surprising. The executive branch is the one that does most of the searching and the seizing. I claim that it is largely, at least that clause of the Fourth Amendment is largely restricting the executive branch. And this is by contrast with the First Amendment, right? We talked a moment ago about how um, the logic of the First Amendment suggests facial challenges to legislative action. I want to say the logic of the Fourth Amendment suggests as applied challenges to executive action. So this is a kind of a rich set of doctrinal implications from digging into the text of the Bill of Rights. And uh, our co-panelists are going to talk about specific clauses, but I want to make the general point. Uh, the text of the Bill of Rights is not exhausted. If you have a hard look at it, um, it can show you things that you didn't know were there. Um, uh, uh, thanks very much for having me on this panel. It was a great pleasure to be in such august company. Um, uh, I uh, uh, was asked to talk about the Second Amendment in part because others are talking about the First Amendment and talking about it very well. And I am such a believer in the text, I'm actually showing you text. <laughs> What's more, I will show you 10 slides of text. And all of them will contain the same text. Uh, so the Second Amendment, was, uh, of course, as we all know, was talked about in D.C.D. Heller, talked about in some measure in McDonald v. City of Chicago, that was more about the 14th Amendment and about the incorporation doctrine, and is being talked about, including with regard to its text, uh, by, uh, uh, by lower courts all the time. There are a lot of very interesting um, Second Amendment case law being made right now in lower courts, both state and federal, some of which is quite attentive to the text, although query whether all was correctly attentive. Um, uh, also, uh, this, the, um, uh, the Second Amendment is actually also something that is talked about, whose text is talked about a lot by the people. The, the people. Some of, the, some of the, 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 pretty much the same people who may be referred to as the people, they talk a lot about it. In fact, in some respects, the Second Amendment textualism uh, has been uh, kept alive uh, while it was largely dormant uh, in uh, uh, among uh, in the courts and dormant, uh, dormant also among scholars for a very long time by I think people who thought well we read it and we reach a different result than uh, than the courts have, have reached. Uh, so let me let me walk a little bit through some of the points, uh, some of the textual issues that came up in Heller and have come up since. Uh, Chiefly, not so much to rehash the arguments in Heller, which I've taken those of you who are interested in have seen for yourselves, uh, but, uh, but also to talk a little bit more about some of the things that we mean when we say textualism and some of the things about, text, about good textualism that necessarily go beyond the text of the particular document being considered. So let's look, huh, all right. So let's look at this text, the right of the people. So the Supreme Court, the majority in the court, uh, looked very closely at the right of the people. But of course, as with much text, it is facially ambiguous. Tremendous amount of text is facially ambiguous. Uh, the Seventh Amendment, for example, talks about uh, a right to trial um, uh, um, in uh, civil cases uh, arising under the common law. 
And I sometimes ask people, you know, what are possible meanings of common law? It could mean common law as opposed to statutes. It could mean common law as opposed to continental law. It could mean common law in the sense of traditional rules as of the late 1700s as opposed to modern law. Like in crim law, you, uh, you may have studied there's the common law rule and there's the model penal code rule. Not so much common law versus statutory because a lot of the common law states have actually embodied those rules in statute, but rather having to do with the way things used to be back in jolly old England and jolly young America. Uh, or it could mean common law as opposed to equity. And it turns out that even though actually the people probably don't ever think about common law as opposed to equity, they, they don't know about this, it's a lawyer uh, concept, uh, but the court actually looked looks at the common law in that sense, and probably correctly, because that was probably the original meaning of the text. But ambiguity is everywhere. There's no doubt that ambiguity is everywhere. Uh, well, the question is, how do you resolve this ambiguity? And here, what was interesting is the, is the court looked at right of the people as it occurred elsewhere in the document, uh, uh, the Bill of Rights and the Constitution more broadly. So it said, look, we recognize that the people could mean the people connect collectively, uh, as in, we the people of the United uh, States, the, the, the ones who ordain the Constitution, you know, it does sound like that's people acting collectively and not just individually. Uh, but when it's right of the people is used in the First Amendment, the Petition Clause, in the Fourth Amendment, as to searches and seizures, uh, in the Ninth Amendment, uh, 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 as to retained rights, whatever that exactly might mean, that's generally an individual right. Now, the dissent disagreed, I think not very plausibly, but it argued actually the Petition Clause right really is a collective right. I don't think that's right. But in any event, what's interesting is when you're talking about the text, and this ties in very closely to what Nick was saying, you often want to look at the big picture text, not just this provision, but the ones around it. All right, another thing that the court asked is what is arms? And it asked about it with an eye towards whether that means military weapons used in the military, or whether it means arms in the sense of firearms, a, a, a class of weapons, most of which may have been used in the military because most weapons have at one time or another been used in the military or their ancestors have been. And the court, the majority said that arms is a civilian term. And how did they figure it out? It looked at the way these terms were used in documents around that time. It's interesting, we are living in perhaps the best time ever for textualism, partly because the justices are more interested in textualism than they had been for decades before, but partly because you can do textualism without working really hard. It used to be to do textualism, you had to read a lot of books, kind of cover to cover. Because when you open up this, this book and you look for the search key, you don't see the search key. Uh, but, in that, but in what, uh, today it's very easy to do search and say, oh, here's how arms have been used in various contexts. Uh, and the court said, well, it means uh, weapons. Uh, inter interestingly, it also said something which I hadn't really thought of before, that it might mean defensive weapons. So this is an issue that is sometimes coming up uh, in lower court cases with regard to bands and felons possessing body armor. Does that even count as arms? And to the, according to the court, it sounds like it does. It's an interesting point. I think they make a persuasive argument, but it's the sort of thing you probably might not think of just by reading the text uh, until you actually look at the dictionaries and look at some of the usages. One interesting thing that the court stresses is some people are saying arms means only those weapons around at the time. And that's, that, that is uh, uh, frivolous, the court said, and I think that's right. Nobody takes that view. Nobody takes that view with regard to commerce. I think few people would say that the authorization for the Army and the Navy excludes the Air Force. Uh, mm -hmm. Although it's an interesting question. If you really want to try hard, you could say, even if it does, certainly an Army and uh, an Air Force is necessary and proper to uh, keeping your Army and Navy alive. Uh, but, uh, but few people think that, and it's interesting, there was a, a libel law treatise in the early 1800s, an English treatise, but, it was, but that was a time when English and American law were still very closely linked, uh, which talked about how, well, of course, the freedom of, the, of speech extends to, to new technologies. After all, the press was once a new technology. The press is but a new and improved way of speaking. And just as if we have a freedom of travel, it would include, if people ever learned how to fly, it would include freedom of flying, and so the freedom of speech includes freedom of the press, and forecasting the new technologies may still ar may arise still further. So I think that's a very important point. Sometimes people try to uh, mock textualism by saying, well, if, if you really believe in the Second Amendment, well, sure, you can only bear muskets. And that's just not right. It's not right as to speech, it's not right as to arms, and I think the court was right in rejecting that. Now, another important thing was to keep and bear because the dissent was arguing, and others have argued, look, bear arms is, usually means military. Bear arms means to fight in the service of, uh, of the government. And the court says, well, that can't be right, because to keep usually, not always, but usually, and certainly in many situations, means to possess. And if to keep meant, and there were a lot of 
contemporaneous sources using it this way to have in your own home. It would be very strange that to keep uh, would mean, mean an individual private right and to bear would mean just the military right. And I think that was a good point. Again, the dissent I I had some arguments against this, but I think also it's interesting to see how sometimes the grammatical relationship between provisions is important. There's a similar debate going on in the First Amendment, and I think Justice Scalia also mentioned this in Citizens United, freedom of speech or of the press, that some people have argued, and I think quite incorrectly, I wrote a long article arguing against this, but some people have argued that freedom of the press means the freedom of the institutional press, the freedom belonging to a group called the press. And one of the arguments against is a grammatical one. If freedom of speech is freedom to speak, how could freedom of the press be not the freedom to print, but rather the freedom of some other institution? That's just not the way English users of the English language, or probably of any language, use these kinds of cl closely connected clauses, except when they're trying to make a joke. And <laughs> The court likewise talked of the same way about militia and about well-regulated, and it was pretty important to figure out what well-regulated militia meant, uh, in part because it would bear on the next question, which is the relationship between the clauses. And there, I'll just say that the court, I think, quite persuasively said that the language of the time, militia meant basically the entire ad armed adult male citizenry. And well-regulated meant not so much lots of laws restricting what they could do, but rather well-trained, well-functioning. Uh, and I think the one thing to take away from this is that it is that if you are going to be a textualist, you kind of have to be an originalist. You may be not rejecting originalism and textualism, but if you care about textualism, it's hard to say, okay, we're going to interpret that text because it was enacted by the framers, but we're going to use modern meanings for words that the framers never contemplated. Again, that would be a sort of a pun. That, uh, that we just use, for example, in the Seventh Amendment, common law to mean common law as opposed to statute because that's what it means today. That's a strange way of interpreting a provision. Free state is another example. I'm fond of it because I wrote a long article about that too. One interesting question is what does free state mean? And actually in the Constitution itself, state often means state of the union. But the court concluded, I think quite correctly, that in the time of the framing, free state meant what we would essentially call a free country. A country that's not so much an independent state of a federation, but rather uh, a country that enjoys liberty. The other thing, of course, that the court famously did, but I don't have the time to get into, is, and I just mark it through the comma, is what's the relationship between the clauses? Does the first govern the second? Does the second govern the first? Can they be reconciled, and if so, how? Let me close with two other words the court didn't talk about. One of them is the, and the other is infringed. I often hear people say, well, Second Amendment is clear. No gun controls. Why? Because, after all, keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Which part of that don't you understand? My answer is, Infringed. I don't really understand infringed. I'm also not really sure about the the, the one after the second comma. Uh, in the First Amendment context, some justices have pointed out, I think quite correctly, although it's not clear what you do with it, is that it talks about the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. It sounds like the frameworks were talking not so much about freedom of speaking and printing, but more broadly, some pre-existing legal concept, the freedom of speech or of the press. So maybe the framers understood, although we don't have a lot of evidence about exactly what they meant by this, the right of the people to keep and bear arms is not just anybody's right to, to have any guns, but rather a legal concept that was to be preserved. But not necessarily to, to be read to its maximum possible uh, extent, uh, but perhaps read with some of the limitations that were present at the time, although again, we're not clear what they are. And the last thing is infringed. I think around the time of the framing, it was, it was well known, certainly in, free, in speech and press debates, it was commonly said, look, not every regulation is an infringement. That doesn't tell us, unfortunately, which regulations are infringements. But I do think it's an important point that I think if you ask the framers, do you think these rights are important, they say, are tremendously important. Does that mean that nobody can ever regulate the speech of the press? Well, of course they can, so long as they don't abridge the freedom of speech, so long as they, uh, so like, likewise, I think they say, so long as they don't infringe the right of the people to keep and bear arms. That doesn't answer the questions, but it does suggest that if we are textualists, we have to be textualists with a real attention to the text and what it may have meant, and not just taking some of the words and assuming that they mean something they might not. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. I'm delighted to once again address this important convention, as I have so often. And I've also had the honor of speaking at many other Federalist Society forums around the country. 
Uh, once again, I would like to thank the Federalist Society, as I always do, and I quoted on some of your promotional materials for saying so, uh, your important contributions to conversation and debate and discussion about constitutional law and civil liberties, um, not to mention your having spurred the founding of the American Constitution Society. Uh, I'm the misfit on this panel, and I say that not because I am the lone civil libertarian here. Uh, lone, sorry, lone liberal, lone liberal civil libertarian. <laughs> Rather, and I'm more of a li civil libertarian than I am a liberal. But the reason I say that I am a misfit is because this panel concerns the court's Bill of Rights textualism but I'm talking about its free speech rulings, which do not take a textualist approach. Uh, instead, the court draws and builds upon a large body of precedents, which contain a, and reflect a complex web of doctrines and exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. Likewise, the court uses a variety, uh, a varying mix of analyses. So not surprisingly, this leads to unpredictable and inconsistent rulings. To support these conclusions, I'm going to quote two federal judges uh, from opposite ends of the ideological spectrum. First, Ninth Circuit Judge Marcia, Marcia Burzon. On free speech cases, she said, lower court judges do whatever we want because that's what they do. In other words, that what, that's what the Supreme Court does. And concurring. On that point, I'd like to quote Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas in Morris versus Frederick, in which the court carved out yet another exception to the free speech rights that it had upheld for public school students in the landmark Tinker case. Justice Thomas summed up the court's rulings on point this way. Students have free speech rights, except when they don't. <laughs> Alas, Justice Thomas's summary applies not just to students, but also to the rest of us. In a recent article, First Amendment scholar Ron Collins documented 48 distinct exceptions to speech protection, which the court has either created or continued to enforce during the past several decades under the leadership of Chief Justices Rehnquist and Roberts, the period that I gather this whole conference is focusing on. Uh, and in another recent article, which analyzes all free speech rulings on the Rehnquist-Roberts court, Professor David Carries concluded that this case law entails, and I quote, an incoherent tangle of rules, doctrines, distinctions, and results. It provides an easy basis for either vindicating or rejecting any plausible free speech claim. Well, despite the many inconsistencies, the court's free speech jurisprudence does reflect some noteworthy general patterns. And in my limited time, I'd like to outline the ones that I consider to be the most important and interesting. Overall, I want to highlight what I call the dark side of the court's free speech rulings. Dark, uh, both in the sense that it, they are negative for free speech and in the sense that many people are unaware of them. The conventional wisdom is that this court has been very speech protective, and it certainly has issued some important decisions that strongly protect controversial types of expression. For example, just in the last three years, the court has held that the free speech clause protects corporate and union campaign expenditures. You can cheer if you'd like. Videos, uh, <laughs> videos depicting cruelty to animals, protesters spouting hate speech near military funerals, violent video games sold to minors, lies about having received military honors, and the non-consensual disclosure of doctor's prescriptions to pharmaceutical marketers. These rulings have understandably drawn a lot of attention, but viewed alone, they are, do not give an accurate impression of the court's overall free speech jurisprudence. Several recent analyses have aimed to do precisely that, and they belie the conventional wisdom about the court's alleged speech protectiveness. For example, Adam Liptak of the New York Times, I see he's going to be speaking here later in the conference, uh, he wrote an article, uh, wrote about uh, analyses of the court's free speech cases from 
1953 to 2011 under Chief Justices Warren, Berger, Rehnquist, and Roberts. And the study concluded that the Roberts Court is hearing fewer such cases and ruling in favor of free speech at a lower rate than all three prior courts. Likewise, this and other studies have documented the following patterns about the Roberts Court's rulings. It rejects free speech claims much more often than it upholds them. In many cases in which it upholds free speech claims, it does so by votes of nine to zero or eight to one, and it affirms the lower court rulings, and there was no circuit split, thus indicating that these were easy cases. Conversely, in many cases in which the court rejects free speech claims, it does so over strong dissents and overturns the lower courts, thus indicating that it is ignoring or cutting back on speech protective precedents. Moreover, going beyond the bare numbers, and I, I realize numbers can show only so much, many, if we look individually at many of the court's rulings, um, concerning free speech claims, they actually have significantly undermined important speech rights. And these rulings, these negative rulings, have consistently stifled would-be speakers who are relatively powerless and vulnerable, uh, namely government employees, public school students, and prisoners. In contrast, a very high percentage of the court's pro-speech rulings have uh, struck down regulations on campaign finance, and commercial speech, thus benefiting corporations and businesses. Now, don't get me wrong, I am one of the few liberal civil libertarians who supports these rulings. Uh, the ACLU was actually a plaintiff as well as lawyer, co-counsel in Citizens United. Uh, thanks for the applause. Uh, <laughs> As I keep telling my liberal friends, uh, I would have faced, as then president of the ACLU, a hefty prison term just for taking out broadcast ads uh, saying that McCain-Feingold was unconstitutional because McCain and Feingold were then running for national office, right? But uh, put that, and Ken Starr volunteered to represent me pro bono, but I decided to make a test case of it. Uh, <laughs> Um, well, so much as I support those rulings, I do regret that the court has not even-handedly enforced the same speech protective doctrines and analysis in too many other cases beyond the campaign finance and commercial speech context. So let me mention just one of the many disparities in the robust free speech analysis we saw in Citizens United and other campaign finance cases that has been sorely lacking in other contexts. So in Citizens United, the court did appropriately, although controversially in many quarters, really subject the government's asserted justification for the challenged restrictions to strict scrutiny. In contrast, Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project 2010, the court passively accepted the government's uh, uh, asserted national security justifications for criminalizing even peaceful advocacy of lawful aims by United States groups so long as it is coordinated with any group that the government has designated a foreign terrorist organization. When then Solicitor General Elena Kagan argued the case in the Supreme Court, she acknowledged that the law criminalized even filing a friend of the court brief in a U.S. court. Yet far from exercising strict scrutiny, the court upheld this draconian speech regulation without, and speech suppression more than a regulation, without any proof that the targeted speech was likely to cause harm. Uh, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to mention uh, that beyond the inconsistent enforcement of speech uh, protective precedents and principles, the Rehnquist-Roberts Court has also created some brand new exceptions to free speech protection, which threaten to swallow what the Supreme Court has called the bedrock rule of free speech jurisprudence, the viewpoint and content neutrality rule that the government may neither, neither favor nor disfavor any particular idea, and yet 
a couple uh, exceptions to free speech that were either created by the Roberts Court or not, uh, not ended by the Roberts Court allow end runs around this core content neutrality principle. Uh, one is the so-called secondary effects doctrine, which is a pretext that the uh, law that is expressly content-based really is aimed at uh, secondary effects such as crime control. The second is the so-called government speech doctrine, which gives complete immunity to uh, government speech. Most troublingly, in 2009, the Roberts Court extended that immunity to non-government speech that it said the government had adopted. I'm sorry, I literally didn't see this stop. So I'm just going to mention uh, in one sentence um, uh, a couple categories of old speech suppressive rulings that the current court has repeatedly declined to overturn despite powerful arguments for doing that. Uh, namely, number one, rulings that give both broadcast expression and number two, sexual expression, only limited First Amendment protection. Thank you very much. I too would like to thank the Federal Society for organizing this wonderful event and for having me and, uh, and my fellow distinguished panelists. What I'd like to do is to focus on the criminal procedure provisions of the Bill of Rights that often get overlooked because they're not taught in constitutional law and primarily on the Confrontation Clause of the Sixth Amendment. And I guess you could say my thesis here is two cheers for textualism. I think textualism is a method that needs to be used and has been used increasingly in the area. Indeed, it even should be the principal or first method of recourse, but I'm somewhat troubled by the excesses in this area that have turned it into the only or exclusive method with all the answers. Um, and I think this is an area in which we see disagreement among the Republican appointees or conservatives on the Supreme Court, with Justice Scalia taking out the most textualist, most pro-defendant position, and Kennedy, uh, the Chief Justice Roberts and Alito, saying, no, you've gone too far. And oddly, Chief, uh, sorry, Justice Thomas has one of two swing justices in the area, which goes to show how little we can get when we try to squeeze the last possible drops out of textualism. And I guess the, the overview here would be, I think it is very useful to use textualism as a way to get us away from just raw policy analysis to guide the inquiry as to whether or not this defendant should be convicted. But I'm afraid sometimes that we confuse textualism with originalism, which is a word with enough broad and ambiguous meanings that sometimes it smuggles in some subjective variations of originalism. And we often confuse textualism with formalism. And the text often doesn't take us to a formalistic bright line rule, much as Justice Scalia sometimes would like it to. So I'll start with the text of the Sixth Amendment. The relevant clause uh, guarantees the accused shall enjoy the right, dot, 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 to be confronted with the witnesses against him. Now, for a couple of decades, long enough for a generation of us to learn something for the bar exam and then have it swept out of our minds, <laughs> the Supreme Court, uh, uh, the Rehnquist Court, said in Ohio versus Roberts that that text just establishes a preference for face-to-face -face uh, confrontation. That preference is not absolute, so let's develop a nine-factor balancing test, right? And Pretty clearly, that's not what the text actually says. And you can understand, you know, Justice Scalia turning red in the face, because that clearly can't be what the framers wanted, just a, 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 a preference that can be overbalanced by any number of considerations. So in 2004, seven members of the court swept that rule away in Crawford versus Washington and said, no, the text says you shall be confronted with the witnesses against him. That's not a preference, that's a rule. And so we look at what a witness is, and we look at what confrontation means, and we look at the historical incidents that this rule was designed to guard against. So first note here, the text by itself is not getting us to the answer. It has to be supplemented with an originalist context. If you looked at the text on its own, it could mean any one of three things. It could mean the position of the great evidence scholar John Henry Wigmore and Justice John Marshall Harlan, that the witness is only the person who actually testifies in court, right? Now that's a plausible textualist reading, 
The court ultimately rejects it not because it doesn't square with the text. It, it may be the best reading of the text, but it doesn't square with the historical backdrop against which the text was adopted. And the historical backdrop is a series of treason trials in the 16th and early 17th century, most notably the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh, in which he was tried based on unsworn out-of-court statements that were being used basically as uh, depositions, except depositions with the benefit of thumbscrews in the rack, uh, <laughs> to, to procure testimony against him. And he said, I'm being tried by the Spanish Inquisition. I want to bring this witness into court because he'll recant. And he's, he's told no, and he's put to his death. And this is widely viewed as an injustice, and everybody around the time who talks about the right of, of uh, confrontation is talking about this. So it doesn't mean the first reading of the text, but it could mean a couple of other readings of the text. It could mean witness in the colloquial sense of the person who sees the crime. Eyewitness is the most common lay understanding of witness, right? And that is indeed more or less the position that the Chief Justice Alito and Justice Kennedy, as well as Breyer, are taking in recent cases. They don't phrase it that way, but that's what it amounts to. Um, or it could mean witness in the more technical legal sense of anybody whose statements are being used uh, as evidence to, now do you say to prove the truth of the matter asserted, to smuggle in hearsay law, or do you say anyone whose statements are being used, period? Or do you say anyone whose formalized statements are being used, which is Justice Thomas's position? Text doesn't tell you that, right? Now, a lot of textualists will say textualism is a species of originalism. Professor Volokh was in good company. Justice Scalia takes that position. And I think most would agree that it is appropriate to say the text at a minimum has to ban travesties like the trial of Sir Walter Raleigh. So the use of out-of-court interrogations to get in you know, the key evidence against you, to be a substitute for live witness, fact witness testimony makes perfect sense. But the problem is we don't know what witness means just from that. So Justice Scalia has to use a maneuver. He turns the word witness into testimony. And testimonial is a key word in the past decade of confrontation clause cases. A testimonial does not show up in the text of the Sixth Amendment. And the right to be confronted is what's in the text. But Justice Scalia in this case law turned it into cross-examination, right? And it's not clear that cross-examination is either necessary or sufficient. In the paradigmatic Sir Walter Raleigh tr trial context, that's probably what it means. But then we take this text and we try to apply it to a set of concerns that were not present in the 18th century. What about when we're dealing not with a, an eyewitness, a fact witness, but we're dealing with an expert witness? What about when the kind of confrontation needed is that necessarily the live face-to-face -face cross examination or is the kind of confrontation more of the nature of exposing the underlying scientific methods and irregularities and, and the ways in which you could challenge the scientific evidence? So in more recent cases, the, the solid seven justices who supported Crawford and uh, Davis and Hammond, which have to do with, yes, you can you can uh, bring in a 911 call because that's not meant to be testimony or as a witness, but no, you can't use questioning of a domestic violence witness on the spot as a substitute for bringing her into court. That's all arguably close enough to the context in which the confrontation clause arose. But then when you try to extend that to expert witnesses, there's a series of very closely divided fractured cases, Melendez, Diaz, Bulcoming, and Williams, where the court by a bare majority says, yes, we can apply this, it's, it's, it's plain as day that you can't use lab analyst certificates, lab results, et cetera, just in the way you can't use fact witnesses. And wait a second, that's not so clear if you question the link from getting from witness to getting to testimony or testimonial, right? Um, for one thing, and again, I, I think I wanna differ a little with my, my friend Eugene Volokh here, um, it is not always clear that there is a pre-existing legal concept to be preserved, at least in the Sixth Amendment area. Maybe it's clearer in the Second Amendment. But in the Sixth Amendment, while that might be true of eyewitnesses or fact witnesses, it's not clear that there was a settled rule regarding expert witnesses. So you get the court struggling for legal analogies. Well, is a lab analyst more like a copyist who certifies that he copied every word on the document correctly? Or is a lab analyst more like the custodian of records who certified that there was no record in the files. 
neither of those is very close. When the analog is close, sure, look at it for originalism to supplement textualism. But when there's not a close analog, and where the text is susceptible of several plausible readings, how do you get there? So, lest you think I'm going squishy, no one less, no less authority than Justice Thomas says that the purpose of this clause, this interpretation has become, quote, disconnected from history and unnecessary to prevent abuse. We've drifted pretty far from the Sir Walter Raleigh trials when we are trying to draw these very vague, strained analogies about which very reasonable people can differ. So there's the, there's the issue of, there's not, it's not clear that there was a pre-existing concept that was meant to be frozen in amber. And when we go looking for it, ironically, much as the case law says we're trying to get away from modern hearsay law, we are freezing 18th century hearsay law, which was pretty cryptic and very much in flux. It wasn't a settled, natural right that was understood. It was a set of technical doctrines that didn't even show up in the, in widely distributed court reports that the people could not have meant to enshrine when they enacted this. Sure, they meant to stop the Sir Walter Raleigh abuses. They didn't necessarily mean to enact every jot, iota, and tittle of copyists' records versus certificates of non-existence. Um, so the final point here is when history runs out, what are we going to do? Are we going to squint? Are we going to draw strained analogies? Or are we going to say, the text takes us this far, this is the starting point, and then after this point, we have to look at how the common law has developed. Is this a right that is subject to having its contours refined somewhat in recent years, even if the core of the right really does need to be frozen at the, the, the core expected application in the 18th century? I think it is appropriate to use textualism as a starting point, and in many cases, it might wind <coughs> up getting us an answer. But when we go beyond that, when we purport to have all the answers with textualism supplemented by originalism in increasingly strained forms, we may undercut the core meaning and the, the respectability of the method. Very well done. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't know quite where to begin, so I'll begin with Roman law, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> One of the things I think that's very important to understand is that we can become all too provincial in the way in which we engage in the topic of textualism and interpretation and think that it is a distinctive and unique set of problems that relates to the Constitution and to only the Constitution. I come from a very different tradition. I'm very proud to say that I don't teach constitutional law on a regular basis and indeed have taught only once in my 46 years of a career. I regard that as giving me an immense advantage over the rest of the panel. <laughs> uh, I have, on the other hand, taught the Roman law course more or less consistently for 40 years. And one of the texts in Roman law that you have is the Lex Aquila, um, which says that it should be unlawful to kill a slave of either sex. Um, that's the text. And what you then do is try to figure out how you explicate the text. And you find out that there are a number of serious problems. Uh, you have to figure out what it means to kill somebody and it means to stab somebody. But suppose you set a trap into which they fall. Have you killed them? Uh, that is furnishing a cause of death. And the answer is you haven't killed them, but it's close enough that we'll treat it the same way. Well, if it turns out that you've killed somebody, were you justified in self-defense or by consent? Those words aren't in the text either. Nonetheless, we read them in there. And then you're worried about past and future harms, and you have to figure out what the remedy is going to be, the overlap with the law of contracts, and so forth. <clears throat> so you start with a text of about eight words, and by the time you're finished with this, you develop an entire doctrine of tort law. Constitution is exactly the same thing. The guys who drafted it were all trained in Roman law, all trained in English legal history, and they sort of understood the way in which text interacted with background principles, because that was exactly the way in which, oh, sorry, my voice. <coughs> that was exactly, get my voice. That was exactly the way in which things were done then, these were all characters who were steeped in classical tradition. And when they started to do interpretation, they wrote statutes and constitutional provisions that looked very much like the ones that had existed earlier on. And they expected that the same tools of interpretation would be used with respect to them. Now, what are these tools? Well, the first one is that you actually do have to read the text. It kind of helps. Uh, the Constitution was not drafted by the faculty of all Yale Law School, which is so transcendent that it doesn't bother with such mundane problems. Um, <coughs> and that, in turn, means when you start to look at it, 
you have to ask what a word like speech means or a word like search and a search like seizure. And what uh, Steve Beppo said is exactly right, which is when you start doing these things, there is a kind of a core irreducible meaning to some of these particular provisions. So that if you deny that somebody who opens his mouth and starts to speak on Hyde Park Corner is speaking and saying they are doing something else, then you're not engaged in constitutional law. Uh, you're not engaged in textualism. You're engaged in the arbitrary use of political power. Uh, but if you then start to look at the various books that talk about the freedom of speech, well, they don't talk about the freedom of speech. What they do is they chapters are always talking about the freedom of expression. And it turns out, of course, that speech and expression are not the same terms. And so the question is whether or not this is a lawless extension of constitutional power by substituting in a broad term where a narrow term is done. And then you start to think about it for a while. And you ask yourself if, in fact, instead of speaking, what you do is use sign language, you start to dance or something of the sort in order to communicate information to somebody else. Have you somehow or other lost the constitutional protections you have? At uh, well, this particular point, we then engage in game theory in the way in which we do this stuff. We say, look, these texts are not just there in order to adorn a monument of one sort or another. They are there because what we do is we don't trust the guys who are in power. Senator Lee, where are you? Um, uh, I don't mean him. I mean his speech, right? Uh, and therefore, what happens is you assume that when anybody is given the kind of power and there is a direct prohibition against them, what they will do is engage in the fine art of circumvention and will seek under the circumstances to find some alternative method to achieve their result which falls out of the literal meaning of the text in ways that allow them to get their objective. So uh, to give you an example, my grandson Noah, uh, we tell him, Noah, uh, it's just wrong for you to hit. And he looks at us and smiles and then promptly kicks me. Um, <laughs> The man understands the principle of textual evasion and interpretation <laughs> at the age of three and a half, right? And somehow those skills are not forgotten when you get a little bit older. And we find other ways in which to achieve the same kind of result, like setting traps instead of killing people by striking them with a blow. And so what you have to do is to protect the speech right and its broader implications. And what that means is you have to cover expression. And then you have to realize when you use a term like a bridge, or even if you don't use the term like a bridge, one thing to do is to absolutely suppress it. Another thing is to tax it. Another thing is to regulate it. And in all of these particular cases, what you have to do is to make sure that if the direct means of government behavior are going to be suppressed, uh, you have to suppress the indirect ones as well. Otherwise, the Constitution will become a parchment barrier. So you then read the basic test to call the, the collateral types of cases just the way they did with respect to the Lex Aquilia when they were trying to regulate private conduct. Uh, but the thing is even more content complicated than that because there are at least two other questions that you have to do if you're going to be a responsible textualist, that is the non-textual part of constitutional interpretation. So let me just give you a sort of a simple contract example. I agree to sell you something for $4. And the question is whether or not this contract shall be regarded as indefinite and unenforceable, because we do not specify the sequence of performance between the two parties and will not allow parole evidence in to solve that particular difficulty. And then you realize, are you crazy? Uh, there are, as Justice Scalia referred to in connection with property cases, certain sets of background principles. And the one that we use here, in all cases, is that essentially each party must tender in order to be able to sue, but neither party has to perform in full before it can get the right of action against somebody else. And you start telling people this, and they say, I've never thought about that. Uh, but when they say they've never thought about it, they don't mean that you're wrong. What they mean is that the regularity of conduct is so strong that they never had to think about it because they always understood that that was the dominant principle of their behavior. And so what typically happens is you have to imply with respect to general text various kinds of exceptions. And the traditional 19th century way in which this was done was very capacious. It was done through what they called the police power. And essentially what they said is every specific guarantee of liberty and property in the Bill of Rights is subject to a general set of limitations in the name of health, safety, morals, and general welfare, whatever those terms happen to mean. Well, why is it that you have to put those things in there? Because again, it's the same thing. Somebody says, you know, in this particular speech, you know, you have the right to freedom of speech. 
Does that mean that you have the right to lie to somebody so as to direct them to a place which they think to be safe, but turns out to be a trap at which they'll be killed? You couldn't do that under the Roman law principles. They were on to that game. Is government now allowed to do these kinds of stuff? And so what you do is you start figuring out justifications that can be used in order to limit, say, for example, speech or the use of property and so forth. And it turns out that no matter where you look with respect to the Bill of Rights, they all have exactly the same contours. If you take the thing seriously, you become a classical liberal. If you don't take the thing seriously, basically you become a devotee of Cole Porter and believe that anything goes, which is sort of the <laughs> modern Supreme Court in the way in which it looks at this particular subject. So what is the libertarian view and what's the other view? Well, the libertarian view says, look, you start with these things and there's certain kinds of behaviors that essentially we understand that we have to be able to control. And so if it turns out that you believe in freedom of speech, you don't believe in the right of people to lie or to deceive, you don't believe that people are now allowed to say your money or your life and say they're protected by the First Amendment when they assault and attack somebody else. Uh, you don't say if somebody has the right to property that you can't disarm them when they're about to come at you with respect to a knife. Now the key thing to understand about all of this is this is not interpretation of meaning. This is not trying to figure out what's property. It's not trying to figure out what's speech. It's a very distinct question of what we mean by way of a justification for government action to restrict the things in question. The police power means that these things exist. And then what you have to do is to sort out the ones that are good and distinguish those from the ones which turn out to be bad. This is an enormously complicated kind of inquiry. And in fact, if somebody says there are 38 exceptions uh, with respect to the First Amendment, they may actually be right in terms of the fact that you have to worry about national security, you have to worry about the way in which you conduct trials, the way in which you operate schools, the way in which you operate prisons. The rules that people have as autonomous citizens are not the same as the rules that they have when they're part of institutions which are allowed to regulate them. So you have to think about the government as a regulator on private conduct and the governor as an operator of public institutions of one kind or another. The military is not the same as the courts, which is not the same as the civil service, and so on down the line. The point about all of this is justifications is a huge topic. And if you go back and you read all the 19th century treatises, what they all do, in effect, is they start and stop at the same point. Police power becomes the operative head of discourse, even though the word is nowhere in the text of the Constitution. And the third issue you always have to worry about is the choice of remedy. Uh, so we heard about the Fourth Amendment cases on searches and seizures. They don't tell you what you're supposed to do. In effect, if you have a violation, go back to Entick and Carrington, it turns out that you had a private right of action and trespass. You deal with the modern cases, everybody's worrying about the exclusionary rule. You can spend days trying to figure out which permutation of remedies is going to be appropriate. And this is the secret of textualism that nobody should ignore. Uh, the hard part, the easy part, is to try to figure out the meanings of words, at least if you want to do it honestly. The hard part is to figure out how you answer the questions that the text insists that you answer, but to which it gives you no clue with respect to what that answer is. And you could only do that if you have a sort of general theory of limited government, and then the things start to fall into place. But if you're a modern progressive, and you start to believe that any time we think we can improve an economy by anything that we want to do, all notions of individual rights start to disappear in favor of an implied right of action in the name of the common good that the government can impose upon us, and you end up with Obamacare. Thank you. If I could, I'd like to, uh, to go back to uh, Professor Rosencrantz's, uh, where he got us started with the who question and, and offer a question to the panel at large. Uh, for example, the Second Amendment, as we know from Heller, uh, there are certain uh, persons who are not among the people, uh, felons, the insane, etc. cetera. Uh, I'm curious what the, your opinions are with respect to the First Amendment. Uh, the Supreme Court, as far as I know, has not distinguished about free speech rights based on age. And of course, in, uh, in Tinker, the familiar statement that students don't leave their, their free speech rights at the schoolhouse gates. I'm wondering whether the panelists think that kindergartners have the same free speech rights as 12th graders and whether they have the same free speech rights as college students. <laughs> 
So um, I actually had occasion to research what the courts have said about this, more or less, uh, because I'm litigating a case uh, uh, on the subject, not in your circuit, so. Uh, um, but uh, so here are a couple of things. First of all, the Supreme Court has said that uh, uh, kids have free speech rights vis-a-vis -vis the government as regulator. And it said it in, of all cases, the McCain-Feingold case, McConnell v. FEC. Uh, one of the little known provisions of that, uh, I believe barred or, I think barred, or at least very heavily limited contributions by minors. And the court struck that down. And there was actually fairly substantial support for it striking it down. Uh, and the rationale was, well, look, minors have free speech rights too. We, we generally don't think of them as being heavy contributors to political campaigns because they don't have a lot of money. Uh, but, uh, but if they want to, somehow they, they could, presumably older minors. Um, so when the government is acting as regulator, it has pretty uh, limited authority over the speech of minors, although it may be different for historical reasons uh, with regard to, to sexually themed expression. Brown, the uh, violent video game case, is another such a, uh, example of saying, look, minors have free speech rights too. Uh, the, the real question is, uh, relates to, uh, to one of the things that Richard mentioned. It has to do with what about the power to regulate the schools? And there are two ways of thinking about it. One is perhaps the power is broader just because there are fewer rights when you're six. And perhaps the other thing is maybe the power is in principle the same, but since it deals with <coughs> disruption, you might expect six-year-olds to need more no. constraint to avoid disruption because they're even less rational than 13-year-olds, let's say. Can I, can I uh, so, so I'm sorry. So in any event, uh, uh, th those are the questions that courts have faced. Generally speaking, they have said that kindergartners have free speech rights too, but we recognize that different things might be required to keep them from disrupting things. But that's the general view, and I think it's probably a pretty sensible one. Um. Yeah, look, no, I'm going to disagree at least in terms of the approach. As I said in my brief remarks, the central distinction under the Constitution is, seems to me is as follows. There are many actions that the government does that regulate us in our private capacities, and I think in those particular cases, the presumption should be against the kinds of regulation they impose unless you could find some justification for them. That's the rule of laissez-faire. That's the principle of limited government. But when you put a government and you have it run kinds of institutions, it has to have the power that a private institution would have to run its same operation. And I can't conceive of a private school which cannot domesticate the behavior of six years old, given the fact that my grandson is sort of out there in the world at large. And those powers are larger. And so the difficulty that you get is when you have this amalgam of a public body and a private body doing the same things, are there additional limitations on what the public body can do relative to what the private body can do? The answer is probably yes, but only weakly so. That's why these cases turn out to be so incredibly difficult. The correct solution in most cases is try to minimize the number of public bodies that you have so that instead of having mixed types, you have pure types. And that would lead you to reconsider, for example, vouchers versus public schools and so forth, because constitutionally, you'd rather have the independent entities with strong rights against the states and the ability of self-governance than having this mishmash, uh, which we currently call public education. This, your question, um, um, Your Honor, is uh, a, a variation of the question that Nick addressed about the who, but it's a different kind of who, uh, who may exercise the right. And I have not done, or I confess, uh, read much scholarship and textualism, so maybe somebody can help me about this. As uh, somebody who has read the text itself rather than commentary on it, what <coughs> leaps out to me mm. on the age question is the absence of an age limitation for these rights when there is, of course, express age limitation for uh, running for high office or being elected to high office. I don't know if anything has been made of that. But on the general issue, um, I think of a statement that Justice Stevens made in one of the abortion cases involving rights of, of minors. And I remember exactly what he said. He said, constitutional rights do not mature and magically spring into being only when someone has attained the state-defined age of majority. So I've always assumed that there's kind of the background assumption that if you have sufficient maturity and competence, you uh, can exercise the right, but that the ju countervailing justifications, as both Richard and Eugene are saying, may well be more weighty and it may be more easy for the government to satisfy strict scrutiny the younger you are. Uh, 
So I'll just speak to the, uh, the other who question as applied to this, uh, to your question. So I insisted earlier that um, the First Amendment binds Congress. Congress shall make no law. The folks who restrict the speech of children <coughs> in schools are usually state officials. And that makes it a bit more complicated. So Baron v. Baltimore says the Bill of Rights only applies to the feds. First Amendment explicitly says Congress shall make no law. However, this is incorporated against the states per the 14th Amendment. And what the 14th Amendment says is no state, state shall. So now you could think that the incorporated version of the right is actually a bit different from the unincorporated version. So the federal version binds only Congress, I insist. But it might be that the incorporated version, no state shall, actually binds all state actors, including uh, you know, teachers and things like that. So your analysis might actually turn out to be different if you're asking the state question versus the federal question. But again, it's you know looking hard at the text to figure out who actually it's talking about. Yeah, and look, this actually is very important. If you take New York Times against Sullivan, um, and then you have the following thing. It goes through the 14th Amendment. Uh, it should go through privileges and immunities, but of course nothing ever does. Um, and so we have that problem. But now what you do is if you had a state code of defamation which says in effect all the things that the Alabama Supreme Court had said in that case, everybody would strike that thing down as per se unconstitutional. And uh, now what happens is if they simply run it through another branch of government, there's the whole question of constitutional circumvention and invasion again. And the Supreme Court just never stopped on that particular issue. And you know, you could think about it. For example, something perfectly constitutional if it's done by common law rules of contract and sale, and perfectly unconstitutional if it's done through the UCC by way of codification. And so I think, in effect, that the substitution across branches makes things very difficult. And I actually disagreed a little bit with Nick when he said that with respect to some of these things like the Fourth Amendment that applies to executive power. I would assume that would apply with respect to a situation in which Congress ordered the executive to do something, left him no discretion on it. He has to faithfully carry out the laws. And I would assume that that legislation could be struck down as per se on its face if it was, in fact, particularly offensive. So I, you know, I, I think the who question question there is actually a little bit more complicated. It's more complicated in, in some of these other cases that we have. So I got to be very, very careful about it. For example, you mentioned the ability, uh, in the situation as to whether or not the executive branch or the president could, standing against the president in, or the, the Congress in the establishment cause cases, then the executive starts to do something and you get a different kind of rule. I think those are some of the worst opinions in the history of Western civilization. Um, my view is that somebody in a court of equity should be able to enjoin any legal behavior by the government and that the Scalia position on standing is 180 degrees wrong because it ignores the words all in equity which are designed to deal with injunctive relief against government abuses like it is against corporate abuses. So I don't think that the answers are necessarily the one Nick gives it to it, but I do think it's asking the right question question. And can I speak to that? So, uh, and I might just answer that Fourth Amendment point. So uh, what I contend is if Congress passes a law authorizing or even requiring mm -hmm. the executive branch to, uh, to perform an unreasonable search or seizure, that the Constitution actually hasn't been violated yet. The Constitution is violated on the day when the executive branch actually performs the search or the seizure. And it's the executive branch that's violating the Fourth Amendment, not Congress having passed the law. Now, it might be, nevertheless, that you can bring a pre-enforcement challenge and enjoin the executive branch from enforcing the statute. But the right way to talk about it is, I don't want to be subject to that unconstitutional action by the executive. Not that Congress has violated the Fourth Amendment. I claim that it can't. It can purport to authorize violations, even require violations of the Fourth Amendment, but it can't itself actually violate the Fourth Amendment. And I'll just offer as evidence in the entire history of the Supreme Court, I believe there's exactly one case in which the court has purported to strike down an act of Congress as violating the Fourth Amendment. As a general matter, they talk in the language <coughs> that I'm speaking in, which is executive branch violating yeah, the Fourth Amendment. That's a typical case. I, I'd like to get back to Judge Hardiman's question about students' free speech rights, because if we 
um, look at what the court, the Supreme Court has actually done. Um, the case that I alluded to, Morse versus Frederick, it was not based on a textual argument. It was not based on some theory of the school as a regulatory institution, with the exception of Justice Thomas's um, separate opinion, who did want to uh, carve out a bright line rule. But the reason the court came out that way as it did uh, was a couple of the key justices expressly said, we're making a drug exception to the Tinker Rule. So when we think that the expression can be reasonably interpreted as advocating drugs, we will allow the school to regulate, but we're not going beyond that. So this is what I talk about uh, when I'm talking about uh, inconsistent and unprincipled and, and that's not a who question, that's a what question. Yeah. The, exactly. tinker, the Tinker carve-outs, yeah. Frazier, yeah. Rosenberg, and those are all what? And, 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 and what's happening around the country, including in, uh, in the Third Circuit, uh, the Supreme Court has a couple of times declined opportunities to review it, is the school purporting to be a regulator uh, enforcing an extremely broad, fluid concept of material and substantial disruption of the educational process, which was the tinker, sensible limit on student speech so that the school could conduct its educational business. That has been interpreted as basically anything the student says on any social medium, on any website, on any blog that could be read by any, that either is about the school, including a school official, or could be read by anybody who attends the school. So they really are reverting to parents' patriae, as I guess Thomas would like them to do expressly. But if, if age doesn't matter, let me bring in Professor Vivas, if age doesn't matter, what does that say about the Fifth Amendment and custodial interrogations, do we consider the age of the, uh, the suspect? Well, what I, th I think that forces us to go back to some background principles when we talk about, you know, who's protected and what. I mean, the court has not done enough with this, but, you know, if you look at the 14th and 15th Amendments, due process and equal protection are accorded to persons, but privileges and immunities and the right to vote are accorded to citizens. Yes. And there's a background understanding that there are political rights they require that you be someone of the electorate. But all these other rights are phrased in terms of persons, which doesn't differentiate among who it is, whether you're a citizen or not a citizen. In cases like Plyler versus Doe, again, that doesn't go to what the right is. It might be that the right might apply differently in the context of a minor, a subject in which I, I don't have a particular opinion to express. But I don't think it suggests that the right just doesn't apply to minors, nor does it suggest that minors automatically get some different right. Uh, it yeah. just has to be translated. Yeah, if I could just uh, return to, I think, what, what we started with, I don't think it's really so much a matter of who, is it a minor or not. The, uh, the speaker in Morsi Frederick was actually 18. Uh, rather, it's what role. Uh, the government, if the government is acting as regulator, which it certainly is when it's in coercively interrogating people and putting them on trial, it's a different role than if the government is acting as controller of its institutions, and many of those institutions tend to involve predominantly adults, like, for example, government employment, or the military, or prisons. Uh, so I don't think it's so much a matter of whether they're minors or not. I think it's a matter, because, just to give another example, if the government were to enact a rule restricting speech in private schools, I think no, we wouldn't apply tinker that if you say a private school must expel a student if he says something positive about drugs. We wouldn't apply tinker to that. That would be subject to the standard First Amendment rules. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a question of government role. It's connected in some measure to constitutional conditions because really what's at stake is you're being denied a government education. You're not being sent to jail. You're being denied a government education. The complicated factor there is because you have compulsory education at least you yeah. most places up to age 16, uh, that's not really kind of the government just offering you a benefit because it's actually requiring that you be educated. But it's related to that, that it's not so much a matter uh, of whether minors have less rights, it's whether the government, what kind of rights should the government have when it's running the particular kind of institution and is threatening not criminal punishment or civil liability, but just expulsion from that institution. And, and Tinker actually supports that point in the phrase that Judge Hardiman quoted, which as a professor I always like to uh, include include uh, an often omitted part of the phrase, which is neither students nor teachers shed their free speech rights at the schoolhouse gate. Um, look, um, I want to go back to the question about uh, the privileges and immunities and due process, because I think that uh, we really are onto something very important there. When they gutted the privileges and immunities clause, the distinction between citizen and person, 
ceases to have major structural significance in the 14th Amendment. Uh, when you keep it back there, the thing is actually much more coherent. If you want to talk about, for example, children, and you start talking, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, it seems to me a perfectly sensible reading of the word due process of law to say that you have to give greater legal protections inside the system to those people who are not able to protect themselves. And so under those circumstances, it would apply whether you're talking about children of citizens, aliens, doesn't matter. When you're talking about privileges and immunities, it's quite clear it has to be a subset of rights that are given to all individuals. And the way in which that used to be parceled out under the natural law tradition uh, was that the citizens get rights to own property, whereas the person only gets rights to have their property which they own not be confiscated. Citizens have rights to empty occupations, whereas the ordinary person who's not a citizen only has the right to be free of essentially arbitrary arrest or something of the sort. You put the whole thing in together, what happens is we now have a very nice kind of balance trying to answer one of the fundamental questions of any political community. How does it govern itself amongst its citizens and what rights does it extend to outsiders? And when the slaughterhouse case obliterated all of this, what it did essentially was to obscure everything uh, so that now you have to use by way of implication those rights under due process which apply to citizens and those that don't, that's a complete force. And you'd be much better off with the original situation, which would get you, I might add, a set of state governments a lot smaller than you have today. Right, Any other comments on privileges and immunities? We could talk about Justice Thomas's dissent in McDonald's or, or not. Were any of you persuaded by that? I mean, my, my recollection of Justice Alito's Rejoinder to that was that was stare decisis. You yeah, know, there is one. There is one interesting point about it. Look, I disagree with everybody on the Second Amendment. I don't think well-regulated state means some independent nation state. I think it means one of the states in the particular constitution. I think the whole clause essentially has to be read against the background of the militia powers in Article One, which do talk about the discipline of the militia and the split of authority between the two sides. Uh, but the interesting complication is if you look at the text on privileges and immunities in Corfield and Coriel, there's not a single mention of anything having to do with arms. Uh, on the other hand, when you start looking at the rhetoric at the time of the 14th Amendment, uh, you can find particular texts which do treat amongst the fundamental rights of privileges and immunities, the right to bear and to keep arms. Um, if you try to run the arms against the states through the Second Amendment, I think it's completely wrong. I think the only place the Second Amendment does not apply is to the uh, Washington, D.C., because it's not federal-state interaction. And then incorporation under this view becomes madness. Uh, but what you then have to do is if you take civil privileges and immunity and read it broadly, then it's a very serious question again. But you can't read it broadly because you've got the slaughterhouse cases. And so everything, I think, in terms of constitutional interpretation here has to face the question that if you get the slaughterhouse House case is wrong, you're always playing catch up. And the single hardest question, in my view, of constitutional interpretation is what do you do in generation two when they screwed up beyond all recognition in generation number one? And that's clearly what happened in the slaughterhouse. It's, you know, in many ways, it's much more disastrous conceptually than something like Dred Scott. Dred Scott obviously caused the Civil War and is more disastrous in all sorts of ways. But since privileges and immunities survive and that whole line of cases continues to go forward, uh, what happens is everything that we've done with respect respect to incorporation is essentially invariably tarnished by the wrong initial step, and we've never been able to extract ourselves from that set of blunders. Uh, I will say about the Second Amendment, I, I think that the court got it right as an original meaning matter, but if you really take seriously living constitutionalism, which I don't, and in the, which I don't either, but in the, Justice Har the second Justice Harlan view, at least the way, it's a, the way he asserted it, that it isn't just living constitutionalism, whatever we justices happen to like today, but really an examination of how constitutional understandings have changed over 200 years, the case for the individual rights would have been much stronger. Uh, that if you look at what coordinated branches have said, Congress has repeatedly said there's an individual right. If you look at popular opinion, popular opinion in is routinely kind of two-thirds to three-quarters in favor of individual right. If you look at state constitutional, uh, 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 state constitution making, now 44 of the state constitutions have individual rights provisions of which at least 40, excuse me, have a right to bear arms provisions of at least, which at least 40 are either by their text or by clear interpretation uh, individual rights provisions. So, and what's more, if you look at the rhetoric around the 
framing of the 14th Amendment, there's actually a lot more talk there about an individual right to keep and bear arms in self-defense than there was around the time of the framing. So if you really take a re living constitution as kind of a common law traditionalist approach rather than just a, well, living constitution is whatever the justices say it is approach, then the individual rights case is even stronger. But you can't use the 1866 discussions to inform the meaning of the 17. Uh, Not if adoption. you're a textualist originalist, well, you're a living I mean, constitutionalist. But also, you do. The That's one you thing, that, let me sort of indicate why I think it's a sort of a little bit strange. The way in which I read it is saying that essentially what this is designed to do is to make sure that the federal government cannot encroach upon the way in which state militias are organizing by preventing them from having gun laws in the state. That doesn't apply to the District of Columbia. It certainly don't worry about the militia in France because they don't have a federalist system. Uh, what that does is in effect is it says it's total prohibition with respect to this limited class of cases. What Justice Scalia does is he reads out the first 14 words out of 28 Amendment, which is kind of heroic, and then reads in a police power exception which is nowhere there. And so I don't understand how that squares with textualism. Um, you have to read the police power exception into anything which deals with basic rights like freedom of speech. Otherwise, it's completely incoherent. But when you're having a federalism type arrangement, you don't have to do it at all. You say, this is off limits to us. And now what happens, of course, is most of the state litigation is over the police power limitation, which wasn't there to begin with. And we go all over the map on the level of scrutiny, the fundamental choice being how, how much above rational basis test is the Scalia test. And it's not all that clear. I don't think there's any way you're going to get that right. Uh, but I think, in effect, it's just a wrong kind of move. That is, I don't think any of these things would be necessary if you read the Second Amendment the way it had been written. And then you'd have to face privileges and immunities. And frankly, if they want wanted to overturn slaughterhouse and get the gun question done whatever way they want, I think it's a well worth trade making because uh, given the hugely negative impact on the theory of limited government that that decision had. I'm going to just briefly note for the audience, in light of our late start, we're going to go to 1130, so we'll, there will be time for questions at about 1115 or so. We have about another 15 oh, minutes. Take them right Does what yeah. Professor Epstein just said, does that relate to the problem of incorporation for a textualist? What's a textualist to do with Congress shall make no law in an age of incorporation? Well, sorry. I had, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry, I, I yield to Nick. Oh, well, I, I just wanted to pick up on that hugely important point. So what is a textualist to do with all of the atextual opinions on the books? This is a really kind of a difficult question. So you can say, you know, I don't believe in stare decisis at all, and I think we should, um, you know, revert to the world as I think it ought to be, and that's, a, you know, that's a plausible view. If you don't, though, have that extreme view, you're left with the kind of uncomfortable trade-offs of saying, well, you know, yes, I have to accept these atextual opinions because there's so much water uh, under the bridge, but, you know, no further. As to this other clause, I'm going to be uh, serious about what the words say. And that can be very, first of all, it's a little bit intellectually unsatisfying, but it can also just be analytically and logically tricky because these clauses do fit together. So the clause where you're willing to accept the atextual reading may actually have some bearing on the, on the clause on which you're trying to be a textualist. And so it becomes quite complicated if you're, um, if you're willing to allow for some of these atextual opinions to stand, and Slaughterhouse case in particular. I mean, it makes it hard to be a textualist if you're willing to tolerate that. If I could so, just add, I think this is a real problem in the Fourth Amendment area where there are a series of non-textual doctrines like immunities for officers, et cetera, that get in the way of the, at least what was the 18th century remedial scheme of tort that hydraulically then have forced us into an exclusionary rule and other things. And it would be great to get closer back to, you know, unreasonable as determinations being made by juries and others, but it would require dismantling a bunch of sub-constitutional doctrines that really prevent the text from operating the way that it did operate, the way it could operate, et cetera. Yeah, okay. so, I mean, on the textual stuff, if you want to talk about private rights of action against government officials, and you want to get away from absolute privilege, which I think there's a great deal to be said for in some, but not all cases. The first line of distinctions you'd want to make, I think, is the line between good and faith, bad, bad faith government action. And so there are many cases recently on the Supreme Court uh, where you have some innocent mistake which is quickly corrected by officers the moment they're told about it. And in the interim, there's some modest Fourth Amendment violation. 
And I think under those circumstances, the exclusion rule is totally inappropriate. And I also think a private right of damage action is not going to get you very far. And what you therefore have to rely on is something they talk about all the time in the Fourth Amendment, um, which is the whole question of administrative oversight. And one could make a credible argument that there's a kind of a administrative constitutional law duty that if you're running a police power, police organization, you have to have some oversight capacity to remedy those things for which exclusion on the one hand and private rights of action on the other hand don't make any sense. And I think we actually introduce systems like that because of the administrative necessity associated with them. But then you get some other cases, for example, the one that I dislike the most is you get somebody who goes in, searches a place, right? and discovers that there's loot there, then goes back to the magistrate and says, I've got independent evidence which tells me that there's stuff there, suppresses the fact that he had already entered the premise in order to done this, and gets the search warrant. My view is this is a duty of full disclosure, and if you went to a magistrate and said, look, I've already cased the joint, and now it turns out that my hunches were just fine otherwise, I'd like the search warrant, you'd be arrested. And yet the Supreme Court said this is okay, for you to do that. I think this is just a terrible kind of situation because it encourages lawlessness and then allows you to fabricate some independent stuff after the fact, and you don't have to disclose to the magistrate the one fact which would set everybody on a different rate. The guy who gets this most consistently right is Justice Breyer. Um, who thinks, in effect, that this good faith, bad faith line in, in Fourth Amendment cases is the one that really ought to be operative. And if you put that all the way through, it turns out that, you know, MAP is a clear bad faith conscious violation of the stuff. You want the exclusionary remedy, but when you get to some of these more modern cases, you really don't want to do that. And that, again, points out the absolute essential ability to have a general knowledge of the theory of remedies and courts of equity long time ago in order to be able to tackle uh, the Fourth Amendment questions. You know, as Richard was talking, the word that sprang to my mind was pretextual, and I just realized how that relates to textual. But it's a similar to a uh, point I made about the First Amendment, that um, it become, and, and the judge and I were having some email communications about this, that somehow, sometimes it would be preferable for the court to straightforwardly say, we're carving out another exception, rather than um, creating this doctrine that can lie around like a loaded weapon to be used against every kind of speech or to allow uh, the kind of conduct that I don't think any of us want our law enforcement officials. And I guess it's to the point of get being boxed into a corner trying to escape from precedent. Um, you don't want to say that the precedent is wrong, and so by Maybe it would be better to just say it's wrong, we're stuck with it, so here's how we're best going to deal with it, the least harm. Uh, so uh, Neil Stevenson is one of my favorite science fiction uh, writers, and one of his books, uh, he, he, there's a... There's you a, read science fiction? Pardon? Mm -hmm. I read nothing but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that explains your legal views. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, oh. I, I, He's, right. talk, he's talking about the Supreme Court opinions he's oh, reading. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm not sure the judges in the room appreciate that comment. Uh, he's, he's such a prolific commenter on our opinions. Uh, well, uh, yes. law, I do not view as a science. So if, there's, if there's fiction there, it's not science fiction. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, so he draws this distinction between brittle rules and supple rules. And he's talking there, I think, about moral code. Uh, and, but it applies equally to kind of legal approaches. So you could ha the, both can be good in the abstract. And in fact, the brittle ones can be better. But the brittle ones are ones when, when something happens, when you're in some way in a morally compromised situation. Maybe you're in a job that requires you to do things that you think are wrong. Maybe you're in a society that requires you to do them. Maybe you're under conditions of privation so you have to do what normally you'd see as corrupt that the whole code falls apart and you're left rudderless. Whereas a supple one is in some respects comes across as less morally heroic and maybe even less morally right because it leaves wiggle room for things that are corrupt. But in the fallen state in which we all operate, it actually leaves you with, a, with something to do and something to say and some way of guiding your actions even when you're in a second best or third or fourth best regime. So I think that relates a little bit to this precedent uh, uh, and textualism um, uh, uh, relationship. That maybe the, 
the right thing to do in some abstract sense is to just follow the text and cast aside all of the precedents that are wrong. But given that that's not going to happen, you have to come up with a second or third best theory yeah. that allows you to reconcile yourself to that. And that's very, very difficult. And that's, in some respects, can be seen as kind of morally compromised. But there's nothing else you can do if you actually want a system for either yourself to live by, that's the ethical code, or for the legal system to live by. Yeah, but and that's way. one difficulty that I think a lot of textualists and originalists have, and others have commented quite extensively on, and that's that you have to have a good theory of second best. Yeah, um, it's, it's actually, I agree with Eugene. Let me see if I could explain the way in which I think this is actually done in practice. If you go back to another area in which the word reasonable seems to have a lot of currency, it would be the tort of negligence, in which you say conduct which is unreasonable under the circumstances shall be subject to liability. If you actually then look at the way in which this thing cuts out, what you discover is there are per se rules within the general reasonableness stuff on either legality or illegality, which covers 70, 80, 90 percent of the cases. So, you know, it's a per se rule that you're not allowed to cross the midline or run a red light. It's a per se rule that you can't fall asleep when you're driving. But if, on the other hand, somebody starts to swerve into you and you guess the wrong way in which to turn, we use a reasonableness test on an ad hoc basis to figure out whether or not you've done or tried to do the correct thing. The same thing starts to happen with respect to the Fourth Amendment. You know, there's a general kind of rule which says if you need a warrant, mere suspicion is not enough. And, you know, we don't know exactly what it means in all cases, but it certainly has a lot of bite to it, and there are other similar rules. But then, on the other hand, if you get a policeman who confronts somebody under a difficult set of circumstances, and the question as to whether or not you can disarm them, attack them, or respond to them in this, that, or the other way, given the fact that there's a wrong to who's going after them, rather than a situation where they're initiating the situation, what you do is you tend to go back to the subjective standards. So what we do, in effect, is we have a two-part system. Routine cases are governed by per se rules. Complicated individual interactions are not. And if you go through the text of virtually any one of these areas that start reasonableness, it comes out that way. I'm teaching water law now. We have a reasonable use test. And it turns out it's exactly the same kind of two-part structure. And I think it's because everybody understands that what Eugene put forward is a really very serious problem. But we don't want to go ad hoc all the way down, right? And we can't go per se all the way down. So we use a set of approximations. We figure out what we could carve out with great confidence on a per se rule and then back off. You do it here, you do it in intellectual property, you do it in antitrust law, you do it everywhere that you have to face any kind of serious question. I was just advised that I gave you bad information. We, we don't have as much time, so please line up for questions uh, quickly for those who may have some and we'll do them as quickly as we can. Go ahead. Hi, this is a question for Professor Rosencrantz. Just going off of your Congress shall make no law thing, how does that address things within the administrative state? Hypothetically, say Congress passes a 2,700 page law that then gives the Secretary of Health and Human Services the right to define key terms, that then outsources that to the Institute of Medicine, that, that is then argued to violate freedom of religion. Uh, how, how do you work with that in their system? I start by striking down the entire administrative state. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, and back to no, second no, best. <laughs> supple, not rhythmic, supple. 90% no, uh, of it's enough. No, no, no. I, I, um, honestly, uh, I think that what you have to do is you have to analyze that question from the perspective of the text. So you have to, you have to interrogate the statute, not the reg. Now, it may be that the statute delegated power that it shouldn't have delegated, and so there might be a kind of a non-delegation problem. Uh, it might be that a statute that um, gives administrative officials power to restrict speech is actually impermissible for a variety of reasons, but I, what, what I want to insist is you have to target your complaint to, the, to what Congress did, because the, that part of the First Amendment is totally unambiguous. Oh, I'm sorry. Here first. Um, Professor Volek, um, there's a, in the Second Amendment, there's a, a comma between the subject and the predicate that I don't think serves any grammatical purpose. Uh, can, some, can it add anything to the textual analysis of the uh, clause, it's the comma between arms and shall? So the one time that I think I most sounded like a crank was when I <laughs> called up the, uh, called up the, the, I think the National Archives and said, there's a typo in your, in your um, uh, version of the Constitution. <laughs> so, uh. I said, no, 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 no. It, not in the original Constitution, in your version. And there's a similar one that Cato, I'm sorry to say, otherwise I love Cato, but that, in this they made the same error. They said, uh, 
in, in here it says, and of the independence, this is Article 7, and of the independence of the United States. It doesn't look like a typo. But if you look at the actual handwritten text of the Constitution, it says in the, in the independence of the United States. <laughs> it's an A in the original text. And what the National Archives did was it also a corrected it to an E. e. Uh, so then they actually changed it. Now it says in the National Archives version, independence. The reason I mention this is they did things differently back then. They wrote defense with a C. They, uh, they usually wrote independence with an E, but the ANTS version was not uncommon back then, the way that it is very uncommon now. So I think the answer is punctuation conventions, and we know this from all sorts of other sources, just like capitalization conventions were just different then. It's not like they made an error. It's that they did something that in the English of 200 years ago, which is very close to ours but not identical to it, was, uh, was uh, right, but today is not. So we have to do a little bit of very simple translation. And I think, as best we can tell, those were what somebody once described as breathing commas. They're kind of commas as, as you talk, you might take a pause. The comma sometimes represents that. So I don't think there's much of a problem. We just have to recognize it's not exactly the same language that we're using. Fortunately, thankfully, it's 99.99% the same, and it's 100% intelligible, with some legalese exceptions like common law and Marx, uh, letters of Mark and reprisal and such, which we need to look more closely at. Uh, but it's not the same, and we shouldn't think it's wrong just because we've changed our usage since then. Uh, so this is a question about the issue of free speech in the public school that several of you mentioned, where I understand it's sort of this traditional logic is that the government has greater power to restrict speech in a government controlled or owned institution than uh, when, it's, when it's regulating the private sector. But I do think in this area it's a lot different than in the case of government employees or possibly prisons because you have a population of people who are forced to be in the public school even though uh, Unlike prisoners, presumably, they haven't done anything wrong to violate the law or whatever, other than perhaps if they weren't there, they would be violating the law of compulsory attendance. And it seems to me that that makes the situation much more problematic because uh, if you say, well, it's okay here to force people and then uh, say because you're now in a government institution, your free speech rights can be restricted, then by the same logic, we can force adults into those sorts of situations as well. Uh, and uh, I think, therefore, to, at the, this suggests either that uh, protection, for, either that uh, the government shouldn't enjoy any special institution authority at all uh, to restrict speech here, or at the very least, it should be much less uh, than it otherwise would be given the uh, use of force in these situations. Yeah, well, uh, um, I think first. there's a little bit of an oddity in that. There is a constitutional right not to send your children to public school if you want to send them to private or religious school. So the notion of, con of, of compulsion is at least conditional upon enrollment in public school system. Um, at this particular point, there's a real question of whether or not there's a public school monopoly, and that becomes complicated. But there's also a question of the need to maintain order in these kinds of places. So I think the answer is all of this stuff kind of moves you in a way of saying, yes, the restrictions that you have in this situation are greater than they have of regulating speech in private institutions, but I don't think it puts you into the position of saying that you can't regulate it at all. Um, it's just going to move the needle a little bit in the direction, I think, uh, against government regulation rather than for it. But I don't think, in effect, that it solves the problem in a categorical way. Let's hear one, one final question. Uh, Nadine, I'm afraid we cut you off just before uh, you were going to express concern about an exception that I think some of us are worried about. Uh, that made in uh, CLS v. Martinez. Only I happened to look at the ACLU website, and I think you mistakenly credit that as a victory rather than a loss. Yes. And, and, and don't you see that as an important exception that gets at those viewpoint uh, issues you brought up? I think that that's a very difficult case, personally, because of, uh, you have more than one constitutional right that's coming into conflict with each other, and you have to do your maximal to accommodate uh, all of the competing rights. I, I'd like to s s turn the question over to Eugene Volokh, because I was surprised that Eugene was on the same side of this case as the ACLU, and you may yeah. be surprised by that as what? well. But not at all on those grounds. I don't buy this whole, well, there's tension between the rights thing, and there's tension between the rights, it's usually because somebody is misreading the rights. Uh, I, uh, but uh, on CLS v. Martinez, uh, I think it's a matter, 
of uh, uh, government control over government assets exercised in a content neutral way, uh, although not expressive association neutral way. So the analogy that I give, uh, and I know time is short, so I'll try to, to just try to give the brief one and then you guys can make it with what you, what you will, is when you, when the government funds student groups, it can say, look, we're only going to fund student groups that are run by students. Well, what if we want to associate with non-students? Nope, sorry. If you want our funding, if you want access to various government property, you've got to have these groups run by students. Or we only want to run, fund groups that are run democratically by students in the sense that there are elections. Well, what if we want to have a hierarchical organization? Certainly there's a freedom to have such hierarchical organizations outside the uh, uh, freedom from government regulation as such. Well, all right, you can have one, but that's not what we choose to fund. Likewise, if what you, the government chooses to fund, and this is the way the case was presented, only groups that let in all comers, that let in all people who apply, the government should be free to say that, especially in the context of universities, which say that's what furthers our mission. So Eugene, I think on we, those grounds, I think that is constitutionally permitted. We cannot let that be the last word. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to say for the record, I think it is one of the most disgraceful opinions ever handed down by the United States Supreme Court for those bullies to pick on this small, tiny, little organization on clear viewpoint grounds. Sure, Eugene, it's a limited public forum, but these kids were students. They weren't outsiders. The whole doctrine of unconstitutional conditions developed in liberal areas when you said, you know what, you want to get your tax situations, it's not a privilege, we can't, ex we can't exclude you because you're a communist sympathizer or whatever. What is so extraordinary is that the entire old rhetoric which says, look, uh, the privilege right distinction doesn't work in constitutional law when the state has monopoly powers is just jettisoned because when just Justice Ginsburg in one of her darkest hours starts to say this is merely withholding a benefit rather than inflicting a harm, she is completely undone 50 years of sensible development in that particular area, and the justifications given of a permissible nature are absolutely threadbare in that case. This was sheer bullying by a public institution, and it should never be tolerated. All right. Uh, with, with that, uh, please uh, join me in thanking our distinguished panelists.